Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the General Eclectic Podcast. I'm your host, Kale Zeldin, and with me, as always, is Rod Dreer. But um, you may notice a few things differently about Rod. Rod, what, what, what's going on here? What's, what's going on? Well, I, I guess I can take my mask off now. Um, I'm in Budapest in, uh, in Hungary. I've just started a fellowship at the Danube Institute. I arrived on Sunday and um, you got to dress up to come to the office. And, but my office for right now is the office supply closet. And, nice, uh, nice. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, isn't it awesome? It's luxurious. Well, we're going to try to change the background for future uh, broadcasts. But I also had to wear a mask because this country has suffered terribly from COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, you still have to wear a mask even when you go outside on the street. Um, it's, it's really striking to me as an American to come here in Louisiana, we had restrictions, but it was nothing like what they've endured here. Yeah. Uh, just to get through the different levels of security at the Frankfurt airport, I got the third degree from a German border guard. I mean, who knew the Germans could be severe about these shocking, things? Shocking, shocking to me. Yeah, I know. And, uh, and then three different layers in Budapest at the airport, but you know, I feel like I feel like all the movies we watched in the 80s about Nazis really prepared you for this moment, though. That's really nice. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I mean, the, the German guy actually apologized after keeping me there for 20 minutes and what should have been like a 90 second exchange. Yeah. He said, look, COVID has done this to us. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I find I, I've been here to Budapest before and I've really been struck by how downcast the city is. And because according to my my friends here, people have really been put through the ringer uh, in a very severe way. So it's a lot of exhaustion here, but people are feeling hopeful too. The government said this weekend, uh, Saturday, they will be able to allow restaurants finally to reopen with terraces yeah. out on the patio. Well, so that, that, that's great. <laughs> yeah, that's pe great, people yeah. are dying to get outside. Yeah, so yeah. anyway, it's great to be here. And I'm glad to be able to join you finally after some trouble getting establishing these connections. Yeah, we're still working on that. As always, I'm sure our regular um, viewers and listeners are probably like, yes, Kale, Rod, we, we've heard your tech woes before, <laughs> but I promise I will wrestle this this beast to the mat. Uh, but at any rate, uh, in the meantime, we've, we, we're gonna move forward with this uh, until we can figure everything else out. Um, I just have a quick question, and this is something that's actually just been sort of on my mind. I, mean, I, I must say that after over a year of, 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 of COVID, I, I feel like I am no closer to understanding why it does what it does and why you have these wildly different, seemingly different outcomes in a variety of different places. And, and, and there doesn't seem to be any kind of logic to it. Like for instance, why has Florida been basically fine and California and New York has been basically not fine, right? I mean, what, what I, I just don't understand what's going on. And we certainly know, for instance, that it doesn't seem to carry on surfaces like they were originally concerned it was but mm -hmm. but like why has it been so bad in europe and and yet parts of america are basically open well good good question uh here in uh, hungary the death rate from COVID has been approximately what it's been back home in louisiana okay even though in louisiana we have far less strict uh, uh, restrictions. Yep. Uh, now it could be that here people live a lot more densely. And so these restrictions, the, the heavy masking, the curfews, that sort of thing, that they felt they were more necessary, sure. but it is a mystery. I mean, yeah. it's, um, it, it's just been a shock to try to get used to it, to have to wear this, this N95 mask that's yeah. not required here in Hungary, but to get on a Lutansa airplane, yeah. you had to wear it. It's mm -hmm. miserable, totally miserable. Yeah, well, and I wonder, Rod, just how different it's been for you. I mean, you know, I, I, I live and work in public spaces in a way that you just don't have to on a day to day basis. And, yeah. um, you know, so for instance, yesterday, I'm in class from, you know, I teach uh, the first, you know, the first four periods on Wednesday mornings. And, you know, I, so that means I have a mask on, you know, I, I, I drive onto campus at around seven, I don't know, 30. And that means I don't really, I don't effectively take my mask off until noon. Um, and it's a weird thing to say that I sort of have gotten used to it. It's not mm -hmm. pleasant, mm -hmm. um, but there it is. It's on my face all the time. And it's one thing to sit in a meeting with it on or sit in a in an airplane um, seat with it on, but I'm, you know, jabbering on, talking on, lecturing on, you know, running a yeah. seminar, and it's a weird thing. And 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 so anyway, I I, I hate it. I mean, I really really 
truly hate it. Um, but it's, but I've kind of sort of gotten, I don't know, accustomed to it. It's strange. Yeah. Well, you know, that's, that actually inadvertently provides an interesting segue into what we're going to talk about next, which is the, right. the whole racial narrative, the George Floyd thing, the, uh, the Kia Bryant thing, being here in Europe. And even though I've only been here since Sunday and watching all of this drama back in my own country play out, it, yeah strikes me as even more, the, the framing of it from being overseas strikes me as, my God, this is even crazier than it felt like at home. Wow. Okay, well, why? So so, so I know that this this phenomenon has happened. I remember um, the first time I, I, I went to Europe as a, as a college student um, reading the, what is it, the International Herald Tribune or whatever mm -hmm. the, you know, yeah. and yeah. I just remember sort of reading it and watching my country from afar <laughs> just automatically provided a sort of perspective that I certainly didn't have growing up. What 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 are you seeing now? I and mean, why is it so odd for you now? I mean, certainly you're still online, you do the Twitter sure, like everybody sure. else and what's going on? Yeah. No, I, I think it's what's so interesting is being in a culture where nobody's talking about critical race theory. Mm -hmm. Nobody's talking about whiteness. Nobody's talking about white supremacy and these this insane ideological framing that it's just in the air we breathe and the water we drink back in America. Even though it's all accessible online now, there's just something different uh, in a way I can't quite put my finger on about having been removed from that and, uh, and, and living in a country where this just isn't on, on the agenda. And it, uh, I, it, I would probably feel just uh, almost as outraged uh, over if I were back home as I do about the Makia Bryant thing, yeah. the Makaya, whatever her name is, the girl who was shot in Columbus, in Ohio. Ohio, but, yeah. But I, I mean, I, I'm sitting there last night in my jet lag, reading on my laptop in my apartment about how you have all these activists and even Biden's press secretary talking about how this white cop who shot this black teenage girl as she was in the process of stabbing someone yeah. about how he's to blame and that this is another case of police violence and white supremacy and all that. I thought, have we actually lost our minds? Yeah, I mean, just on a practical level, I mean, what and in, in, you know, I cannot imagine wanting to be a police officer yeah. right now. I, yeah. I just, I mean, really, you're damned coming or going. And I'm not, look, you and I have been pretty clear about this. I, you know, I, I think what happened to George Floyd is, 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 is a mess. It's a tragedy. You know, he, didn't have to die. He shouldn't have died. Uh, certainly at the hands of Derek Chauvin, as he's been convicted mm -hmm. of. Um, but I'm I'm so struck. I mean, look, we talked about at the end of last show that I was worried about the verdict, and I didn't quite realize it was going to happen so quickly. Mm -hmm. I'm used. To, I know in my head, I had the OJ trial in my head, which was yeah, yeah, months yeah. and months and months. But this is obviously less complicated. Um, so anyway, but but you know, so you have all this energy, and I, and I think that people were genuinely. I, I don't want to over state this, but I think they were genuinely ready to sort of throw down. And the verdict came back guilty on all three counts uh, in, in the max. And so you have all of this sort of energy. And I, I'm <clears throat> pretty sure you maybe you can check me on the time frame here. But I believe that the video of the girl being shot as she's stabbing another young girl um, released almost at the same time as was. the Floyd verdict was being announced. And so you have all of this. So we have all of this energy that was being uh, focused on. I think they were they were kind of ginning up for a for a not guilty verdict or a, or a sort of a, a waffled verdict on the Chauvin case. And so you've got all of this energy and it's almost like that the energy needed a a a a a something through which it could be channeled and realized and had to had to discharge yeah right yeah. right right you 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 amp this you like you know you pumped up the gun or whatever Im image you want to mm -hmm. use sorry to use the gun thing but and then you had it has to be energized and and so it, it then tacks to this thing and then you're seeing on on the news feed people saying i mean versions of oh kids get in scraps all the time knife fights I, i'm like really that that's how we're that's how we're going to go here because the 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 narrative as you put it the narrative of whiteness right the narrative has to be it has to, it has to be served it has to be served and it, yeah. and it does and I asked because you asked right <laughs> what 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 are they preparing us for I I, I mm. okay well here here's something that I just learned just before we came on today 
there's something in Foreign Affairs or Foreign Policy magazine where uh, whoever it was who wrote it, it's some scholar, I didn't have time to check the byline, this literally just happened. Mm -hmm. uh, it's published a piece saying that the George Floyd verdict is just the beginning. And now we need to have truth commissions and all sorts of things to get racism in America sorted out. And uh, I, I'm thinking, are you insane? Do you really think A, this is gonna happen and B, this is a good idea? But I'm telling you, part of the elite narrative here, I've been seeing just since the Chauvin verdict, uh, people, my readers have been forwarding me emails they've gotten from their employers. Yeah. One works at the US uh, Department of Agriculture, another is in a private employer, where the upper management feels compelled to send out emails to the employees about this criminal trial verdict. I think that this is something that has absolutely obsessed the elite leadership class. Yeah. And uh, I think that so they why? are Okay, so, so I agree. Why? why? Why do they feel the need to become public relation hacks every time something happens? Like what, what, uh, what, is, what is, is this, is this a positioning? Is this sort of establishing themselves in some sort of, um, frame of virtue? I and mean, what, what's the deal? Yeah, I think, I think that's it. Don't you? I mean, it's, it's virtue signaling, but it's beyond virtue signaling because as we've seen, if you thought that a guilty verdict in the Chauvin case would be the end of it, you know, oh, thank God the system worked. If, if you believe that he had been murdered, you know, the system worked, forget it. That, as you say, that's not the trajectory of this, then the, the actors here who are driving this on the left mm -hmm. um, will not be satisfied until they have torn down everything. And uh, this is something that the, not only the, the way they behaved after the Chauvin verdict, but the way so many of them have behaved when you have a clear cut case of a white police officer having to make a split second decision that actually saved the life of a young black woman who was being stabbed. And now, this has become another example of whites. I mean, it, the, logic and reality has completely left things here. Yeah, the, I, the, the, there's a decoupling. The, there seems to be a serious decoupling uh, that has occurred that uh, yeah. is really frightening. I mean, this is sort of a, 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 I think what you're getting at, there's a sort of a, 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 a you know, a, a fault line that has sort of opened yeah. up, but, you know, between yeah. reality and narrative. Exactly. You know, I, uh, I when I was reading the, the stuff last night online about the left's reaction to the Micaiah Bryant thing, I was reminded of a line from Hannah Arendt's Origins of Totalitarianism that I, and I, I quote this in Live Not By Lies. Mm -hmm. And uh, Arendt talking about the, the things that led to totalitarianism in Germany and Russia, she said of the elites that the elites mm -hmm. did not care if they tore down the fundaments of civilization as long as they felt that they were allowing those who had been dispossessed and kept on the outside to rush in. Same thing is happening now. Yeah. Uh, if, if you can sit there and look at what happened on in Columbus, Ohio, and see that as an example of white supremacy and police brutality, then there's no hope for you. You, you are tearing down the rule of law in, in the United States. And there's got to be some kind of pushback. I, this week, Kale, I was here in Hungary. You know, I was uh, uh, wondering what uh, the Hungarian government had done about gender ideology. Just one of my readers had sent me some craziness in in Ontario and public education about uh, grooming little children to accept gender ideology and that they could be one of fifty different genders and so on. I just wondered. What, do, what are things like here in Hungary, this country to which I've just arrived? I Googled it, found out that um, the Viktor Orban government uh, last year passed a law uh, defining a, a, in law that male and female are whatever you're born as biologically, that's what you will be on legal documents. Do what you want <laughs> elsewhere, but that we're going to stick to reality here. And uh, last year, I think it was, it banned uh, state funding of gender studies programs at state universities. Now, I, that initially struck my uh, classical liberal heart as maybe sure. going a little too far. Right. You know, should the state really be talking about telling universities what they can and can't study? Now, though, in the course of just a couple of days, I think, oh, absolutely, it should. Uh, it uh, Because you see what gender ideology, how it's tearing America uh, apart, and even more strongly, if you see how critical race theory is tearing America apart, 
this country, Hungary, and any country would have to be crazy to welcome that thing into its its universities and into yeah. its discourse. I, I do think that your instincts are correct. And I think there are of a piece, you know, you talk about the, the gender ideology piece and you talk about the critical race ideology. Um, I do think that they are, are of a piece. I know some people have talked about that we truly do live in this sort of age of post-modernity. And I, and I do think that that's where we are. And, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of a, um, of a video I saw a couple of years ago, it's it's actually done by a, an Australian um, a documentary filmmaker named Mike Nana, and he uh, did some documentary work on the grievance studies affair. I think he's friends with those guys. Yeah. Anyway, well, I've seen um, that documentary. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a great documentary, and, he, and, and he, they do a three part series on the Evergreen uh, case with Brett Weinstein and Heather Hying. And at one point, so they're interview. He's interviewing um, uh, Weinstein, and he's talking, and, and he's talking about all the madness there, what was happening there. Which again, one more time, is sort of a writ small version of what we're seeing play out in, mm -hmm. in, in in a various front war. And I hate to use that imagery again, but I think it, but that's it, what it's, it is. it's apt. Yeah, it is. It's apt. Um, that that it's a it's an attack upon the fundamental logic of civilization. And and I don't think one, you know, I remember when I heard that him say that phrase. And then this was remember, this was two years ago. This is before the lockdown. This is before the George Floyd case. This is before all the stuff that we've lived through. Um, and this was simply based upon the experience that he and his wife had had at Evergreen State. And you, and I'll provide the show link down at the bottom of this um, video. It's a great series. But anyway, the point is. So what happened there really um, is what we're seeing play itself out now. And, and you know, you've made this point before, Rod, and I think it actually bears repeating if you could rim riff on it a little bit more is that, you know, these are the kinds of things that people used to dismiss as, oh, why are you focusing, focusing so much on these sort of wackadoodle things that happen on college campuses? Well, guess what, people, you know, all those wackadoodle things that have happened on college campuses before, you know, where the where the sort of the pre snap read to use a football analogy, you know, it's a sort of a it was a dry run to what we're seeing play itself out now. Sure. And we have sure. we have media players and political players um, motivated people in in the the you know the the ruling class so to speak that that are incentivized to stoke this and boy they are doing it at just um really it's impressive if it weren't so scary to me it's really quite impressive what they're pulling off yeah and now here's something that is really challenging my way of thinking and i think it, it happened by coming here to hungary and just mm -hmm. inserting myself into a very different political and social context mm -hmm. You know, uh, Pre uh, Prime Minister Orban is extremely controversial here in Hungary, as most people know. And I've always said, uh, based on having come here and, and actually talked to real Hungarians, that uh, all the European right, whether Orban or the uh, Law and Justice Party in Poland, the Vox Party in Spain, they're all terribly maligned and inaccurately reported on in the American media. There's just no question about that. That's not to say that they're all perfect. I mean, they've got their normal political parties, they have problems, but you can't really understand what's going on here if you depend on the American media. Now, having said that, um, I, I posted something hey, on my hey, blog. Hey, hold the phone. <laughs> Are you saying that our 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 information stream is being constricted and warped and turned in a certain way and framed in a certain way? I mean, I I'm as shocked as you are, Rod. I know, yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, here's here's the thing. I I put on my blog like the first day I was here when the, the business about you know I it made sense to me that that uh, the Orban government and the Fidesz party has done what it's done on gender ideology to fight this madness mm -hmm. well i got a lot of extremely angry vitriolic commentary from hungarians living in hungary commenting about how you don't know what you're talking about you're a lapdog you're a useful idiot for this dictator blah 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 and uh, you know that's that's their point of view you know i'm i'm new in this country i'm not going to get involved in domestic politics right that said it, it occurred to me that what these people are criticizing is actually the de facto state of affairs in the United States under liberalism. In other words, you could not write a piece for the Washington Post or the New York Times really laying into gender ideology in any way or critical race theory yeah. in any way. People who, as we've seen with Ryan T. Anderson and with Amazon, you, you can't even get your books published increasingly if you criticize this narrative. And so what 
what I'm, it's making me think, and I, this is a tentative judgment now, I'm just, I'm going to start following this path while I'm here to think through it. What I'm thinking is Orban understood the fundamental illiberalism of these people uh, on the left, you know, trying to pretend like they're the real liberals here. He understood their fundamental illiberalism and he's fighting back. The thing that I worry about is I myself, I, I want to be in a society that is classically liberal in the in the sense that uh, we all can we can talk about anything we, but we don't live in that dream world and I I feel that on the one hand I feel da very David French like and I want to defend <laughs> classical liberalism but the reality is that we the the people who claim that they're liberal aren't even liberal that way and uh, even though the laws themselves permit freedom of discussion uh, nobody's going to shut down your newspaper. Uh, because of your political discourse in the U.S., but in a de facto sense, if you are a social or religious conservative, you're shut out. Look at what happened to yeah. Tom Cotton, Senator Cotton, yeah. whose position was actually correct and popular about deploying National Guard right. troops to stop the rioting. He, right. I, I'll get off my soapbox. Now. No, it's fine. Uh, the the point is that uh, we on the right, and some of us on the right, are all way down the road, but. It just really strikes me this week being in Hungary and now watching what's happening in the U.S. and the way the monopoly in the mainstream media, in the left wing monopoly in the U.S. is uh, ramrodding this incredibly destructive and toxic uh, race discourse uh, through the country and it's preparing the country for some kind of uh, violent con racial conflict. It strikes me that uh, Orban's illiberalism and the illiberalism of the democratically elected governments of, of, uh, of Central Europe um, has a lot more to be said for it than I had previously thought. Yeah, you know, the um, uh, Barry Weiss made a similar point in her recent subspat in her recent substack. Like, you know, look, the reason why I left the New York Times is because I can't publish the things that I'm trying to publish now, which are necessary voices for what is going on. And you know, Rod, I think. You've known this for quite some time, and and I have, I believe. Um, you know, we're already done. I mean, the two of us. I mean, we're religious and we're conservative. I mean, we really mm -hmm. have zero purchase in the the the, the grand master narrative I mean, of white of, penis hunters too. So. Yeah, right. Yeah, you know, we're white dudes. You know, we're Christian, um, and and you know, we're traditionalists and all of that sort of stuff. And so we're already kind of quote unquote beyond the pale. What what is I think really surprising to me, and I think what really needs to happen if we have a shot is, you know, where are our liberal, um, our, our left leaning liberals? You know, those uh, are the people who I truly believe have to step up and beat back the, the, the fringe that have become the mainstream in, in the narrative formation. Um, well, I, and, and I, and, go ahead. Yeah. I'll tell you where some of them are, at least. Barry Weiss and uh, Thomas Chatterton Williams, Coleman yeah. Hughes, Glenn Lowry, and others have started a new organization called FAIR, F-A-I-R. I forget what it's about, but you, it's there. I forget what those that acronym stands for, but it's about defending uh, classical liberalism in this course. They've come out this past week with a full-throated defense of Peter Rossi, right. the teacher at Grace Church School yeah. in New York, who's yeah. been fired uh, for having... Well, I don't think he's out. been fired yet. I, I think he's been uh, asked not to come to work. I yeah, believe. but they, most recently, I think they told him they're okay. not going to renew his okay. contract. Yeah, so, which is, it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Right. But they've come out and with a full court press defending him. And I, I look to see everybody who was involved with that. And we've got Andrew Sullivan, Good. Megan Good. Kelly, Good. people Good. of the center right Good. and the center left Good. who are taking a stand. So God bless them for that. But They've got an uphill battle. And the, the thing that that I'm having to struggle with intellectually, and I don't know where I come down on this, is, you know, I, I started out this part of our of our blog or of our, our podcast talking about how uh, I can see from where I'm sitting now that it makes perfect sense to do what you can to suppress discourse on critical race theory and gender ideology because it tears society apart. It it makes it impossible for civilization to do what it should do. I mean, that you can see so clearly that this is driving Americans to hate each other and to tear, tear obviously, the whole- Obviously, obviously, right. this is clearly right. what we're seeing. And it's designed okay. It's designed to do that. Yeah, and, so, and, yeah, go ahead. Well, uh, agreed, I, 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 I'm extremely heartened to see these folks step up to do this sort of thing, but I, I, 
a year and a half ago, two years ago, when the uh, t- speaking to your you don't know where you stand position, mm-hmm. which which I, I you know I I'm I'm in a similar position I believe, and and this goes back. I remember the first time um, the the so called you know uh, Amari versus French thing surfaced. I believe it was on a first things article that um, uh, Sarab um, printed about sort of Frenchism, uh, sort mm-hmm. of a stand in for David French as a sort of a totem for um, kind of conservative Republican fusionism, right, right, kind right, of classical right. fusionism. And I remember um, you and I, right away, I remember texting back and forth with you about this. Um, and and I remember saying something to the effect, gosh, you know, sometimes I agree with David French and sometimes I agree with Sarab Amari. My Two. gut tells me that Sarab is probably more correct, but I can't find any like sort of terra firma with which to feel comfortable in in this sort of space. But I do know, and I remember you and I both, I, I, we both thought it's really important to have this conversation because it it still seems unresolved. Well, see, the, and this is where I am now. I've heard myself in this podcast and I've had a real serious thought this week that, yeah, certain uh, er, certain conversations or certain uh, ways of thinking ought to be suppressed. But then that puts me on the same yeah. side, at least theoretically, or at least running parallel to these illiberal leftists who want to suppress people like us. So uh, you can see where the, the the real tension is here. I mean, again, ideally, I'd want to be in a society where we could all have our say, but. Um, the, the things that they are promulgating and ramming through the institutions and into the heads of our children and into the heads of, you have these people standing out in Columbus who sat there and watched this fight, these uh, African-Americans living in the neighborhood, they watched this fight, right? They watched, yeah. uh, they could see on video, this girl trying to stab another girl and then yeah. get and, shot. And they, and they tack in real time, they tack from, oh my gosh, you know, she's stabbing that other girl to, oh my gosh, look what the cop did. Right. It, 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 like in real time, it, it, it happened. Yeah, and, and you can see now that that insane attitude is now general among I mean, I mean, that, liberal elites. That's psychopathy. Yeah, that, yeah, uh, yeah. Valerie Jarrett, Obama's big, um, big uh, ally. Uh, she was a like chief of staff, right? She, yeah, yeah, something like that. Mm-hmm. You know, she put out a tweet right away yeah. saying that, like, this is clearly, you know, racism, police brutality. And I'm thinking, so this is where certain ideas will take you if you don't shut them down. Well, now, and it's so again, irresponsible, though. It's so irresponsible. Yeah. My gosh, yeah. being a be an adult. Yeah, they can't do it. They're, and Jen Psaki, the White House press secretary, yeah. you know, she was asked about this. She kept right on message. Now, um, I mean, we're we're heading to a really difficult crossroads here because uh, I, I think people were, and I know I'm, the, I'm this way, and I think a lot of people, Americans are this way, thinking there is no way to compromise with these people on the left. They're going to keep pushing and pushing and pushing until, I mean, look, if you're a cop, and you get called out to a, a, a situation of, <clears throat> in, in a black neighborhood or involving black suspects, mm-hmm. you want to drive slower. You don't want to get there in time because whatever you do, even if it can be proved that your actions save the life of a black person, mm-hmm. not going to matter. And you saw LeBron James, you know, one I of did. the world's I'm glad, I'm glad, athletes. I'm glad you're bringing this up. This is huge. I, I think it's huge. Yeah. One of the world's richest, most privileged athletes he put out something with uh, the face of the cop in Columbus who shot uh, Makia Bryant and said something like, you're next, accountability. Yeah, yeah. accountability. Oh my God. I, I gotta tell you, Rod, um, on, on, a, on a connected note, but a side note, two words in the last six months have have started to send chills through my veins. And the first one is what you just said, the word accountability. And the second one is the word reckoning. And it's chilling to hear people use those words in a political context and not do so ironically. Right, right. And and let's get back to your question. This is what they're preparing us for, some kind of showdown. You know, I mean, I, I, I hate to hear myself say that, but what can you conclude if you have, you know, after the kind of week we've had when you, and when you have one of the most privileged and cosseted, 
people in the world yeah. say this sort of thing, you know, about a police officer and legitimize vengeance in that way. He took the tweet down, but yeah, but notice he complained. He's like, I'm sick and tired of my tweets being used to to foment hate. And you're like, um, I'm Dude, sorry. It's you. Well, yeah, right. You, you know, the call's coming from inside you. <laughs> Yeah, um, I, to, to mix I, my metaphor a little bit. And I, you know, I, I'm, it's easy for me to say this because I'm not a sports fan, but if I like the National Basketball Association after all this, the hell with them all. I, I would just, yeah. I could not put up with it. I couldn't be part of any of this, this hatred, this race hatred directed against the police, against the forces of order. I mean, again, it's tearing apart civilization. And you can say that even if you say, as seems true, that Chauvin needed to be convicted for what he did to George Floyd. Yeah. I mean, we can walk and chew gum at the same time here. Right. Two things can be true, as they like to say. Well, I want to give an award this week to the most honest politician of the week award. And this might come as a little bit of surprise to you, Rob, but I'm going to go ahead and give the Kale Zeldin Award for the most honest politician of the week award to, drum roll, Nancy Pelosi. Yes, hey. you, you heard that correct. Um, Rod, did you see her performance um, at the press conference uh, upon the announcement of jo uh, Derek Chauvin's conviction? Happily, I did not. Well, fortunately for you, <laughs> the transcript is available. You can so you can read. So in this moment, um, uh, this spontaneous moment in which you know there's a podium and everything set up, right? So in it's it's all freaking staged. Anyway, um, she gets up and she thanks. George for dying. Are you serious? I'm serious. She thanks she thanks George Floyd for dying and sacrificing his life for justice. Okay. So he's like he's like so, black American Jesus. Well, and, and if you look at the transcript, the 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 use and abuse of explicitly religious language and the language of sanctification and martyrdom is explicitly being invoked. Okay, so Wow. Amazing. I, I urge you all, I urge you, Rod, and everyone else, go mm -hmm. read the transcript. It's amazing. But I, I'm 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 in preparation for the show. I'm I'm um I'm I'm stirring my my tea here and I'm thinking to myself, I can't believe I thought it was a joke at first. You know, I thought that the headline was a joke, and then I went in and I saw the video and then I read the transcript. I was like, nope, nope, the transcript's correct. Um, she actually thanks George Floyd for dying for justice. And um, and then it struck me, she's like, Well, you know. Because my first reaction was like, I, you know, how can you be so brazen uh, with which to say something like that? It's, it's mm -hmm. really rather despicable. But then I realized she's actually being honest. Like, thank you for giving me an opportunity to grift on and to yeah. use and abuse the death, the, the, the unnecessary and tragic death of, of a black man to further my political agenda. I mean, it I know it's, I'm, I'm being a little bit tongue in cheek here, but it really is true. I mean, it is is absolutely abusing an awful situation to like to 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 give it to the opposition to like to screw in screw it into the opposition, which is ipso facto Jim Crow, and you know the use and abuse of Jim Crow is is mm -hmm. is beyond the pale. Well, you saying this uh, makes it so clear to me that. What uh, James Lindsay has been saying for years now, what I say in Live Not By Lies about the whole social justice movement being essentially a pseudo religion yeah. is true. Yeah. I mean, this is not politics. This is politics as religion, which I, at the risk of beating a dead horse yeah. is what communism was, is what Nazism was. It was the politicization of religion or rather the sacralization of politics. See, but I thought, but, but Rod, but, but hold on. I thought that, you know, the, the, the threat of theocracy was from the Christianist <laughs> right. I mean, what, what's, what, what's the deal here? Yeah, well, again, this is the, this is the, the deception that the self-deception maybe that the left is doing. I mean, remember it tell, it calls itself liberal and, but it suppresses any kind of speech for or dissent from the right. Yeah, you know, and it calls it. It wants to protect us from theocracy, and so, but it has sacralized politics, left wing politics, and yeah. the Pelosi thing is a perfect example of it. Yeah. I mean, it's gosh, this, 
I mean, if we're I really so, we're, have, we're so screwed. Yeah, we are. If I if I really had my tech technic my technical act together, I would have had that video queued so I could watch you watch it in real time and mm. and, and and show it to you. But it, it really is a staggering um, and and disgusting, um, uh, almost as bad. Actually, no, it was worse. But it's close to Maxine Waters' performance. Um, uh, a couple of days prior to the announcement of the verdict in which she was essentially telling uh, the writers that they needed to keep doing it. They needed to keep going because, you know, who needs the rule of law? Yeah. Well, I, I'm going to be going to France next month um, to oh, promote poor. Live Not By Lies is coming out in poor France. You. And I've just, yeah. Oh. Well, I, I, you know, it's, it's actually something that I, normally I would be so happy to be going to France, but it's difficult to travel here. And yeah. uh, if I, you know, to get back into the country, Hungary could be difficult. So mm -hmm. having to negotiate that sort of thing. But the reason I bring it up is yep. I'm going to be really interested to see how things are going in France, how people are thinking about this. Uh, Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, came out recently and criticized uh, critical race theory and said, we don't need this in France. And he's right about that. This American import, which is so rich, right, right, because right. of course, so much of it is influenced from the French schools of the 60s. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that gets sure. too good. Sure. Too good. Well, just today, uh, news came out here that a group of about 20 retired French uh, generals, mil military officers, um, said that uh, called on issued a public letter calling on the French to return to quote unquote honor. And what it basically meant is saying like, we can't have this crazy stuff in the country. It'll tear the country apart. So the, that said to me, or I, I haven't read the thing yet. I'm going to do it later this afternoon, but this says to me that Europeans are watching America destroy itself and they're trying to stop the contagion while they can. And I think they're absolutely wise to do it. I'm going to be saying that when I go to France to promote the book, if I, I'll be doing media interviews uh, and I'm going to tell them, warn them, like this is going to bring about totalitarianism if you don't stop it now. Yeah, and I, and I think that that is, is the apt um, metaphor or image, you know, this sort of mm -hmm. social, this contagion. You know, it, it, it's not surprising to me that, you know, we've been dealing with a, an actual biological one uh, for the past year plus. And here we are, we're dealing with uh, a pathogen that is honestly, you know, again, I, I, I offer this without hyperbole, at least I think I'm offering it without hyperbole. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's, as, it's, it's, it's more um, threatening. Um, you know, we will survive uh, the, we will survive coronavirus. Right, mm -hmm. uh, we collectively, as 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 a race, a human race, so we will survive the coronavirus. We always do. We will adapt, and we will we will move on. Right, but you know, you you wonder, uh, but but of course, the the um, the carnage is going to be real. You know, real people die. This is this is this is no joke. This is not a rehearsal. This is not an idea. That real real people are dying. But I'm I'm I gotta say more concerned, <clears throat> more concerned um, about the the corrosive effects. Of 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 the internal pathogens that that are threatening the body politic, and no. I I just you know I look at the story of you know Grace Church and I look at the stories you know that that are that are popping up around and I'm super excited for people like Barry Weiss and and James Lindsay they're doing the work that they're doing but I just don't see I don't I don't know how. Uh, how there's going to be an effective rallying of of the troops because yeah. uh, because the they, they've already taken care of the first sort of fundamental which is the sort of the shared story of us the shared story of mm -hmm. us as an american people um you know as complicated and, and and interesting as that is but but they've 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 effectively taken that away and they've done so really while everybody was sleeping yeah. and they've done that by way of 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 the the cannibalizing um of 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 the academy yeah and and now they're doing that this is what the thing that the 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 reader of mine in ontario was trying to tip me off to is that now they're explicitly doing this in elementary school to plant the idea in the mind of, of children that they could be anything. They could be a boy, they could be a girl, they could be, I mean, why would you do that? This is this is child abuse. Well, well, uh, we, no, no, we see we need to save lives, Rod. Right, right, right. We're, we're saving see, lives. Yeah, it's the therapeutic totalitarianism, yep. but, yep. but to, to follow your idea about the body politic being infected, um, 
I, I read an interesting statistic this week about how 78% of those who have been hospitalized for COVID are obese or at least overweight. So um, let's take that metaphor over to those who've been in uh, 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 body politic infected by this right. mind virus, right? Yep. We are an obese society, yeah. a flabby society that, yeah. that has yeah. lost its tone, you know, and we are so susceptible to this sort of thing. And now we're seeing it. I mean, I think that there is, it, it's almost too on the nose, right? That, that this particular virus, uh, the, the coronavirus has hit at a time when we are susceptible because of being so out of shape, so to yeah. speak, and yeah. decadent that we have lost our defenses against this incredibly malicious um, uh, virus, that critical race theory, gender ideology, and so forth. I mean, it's, well, it, well, if you are a novelist right now, yeah. think of what you could do. Where is Tom yeah. Wolf? I yeah. wish you were still with us. Yeah, well, right. That's exactly right. You know, that, that you know, a, a decadent society can get away with peculiarity and oddity. And, you know, you can sort of, you know, it's like you, know, you could afford, if you're a really popular band back in the day, you could afford to sort of put out an experimental album because mm -hmm. you're already like a, a big deal. Um, but when you spend too long sort of, playing on on peculiarities and not focusing on the main thing um you lose a sense of what you are and so then when it when it when a storm does come there's no that you know the, the 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 foundational things haven't been attended to um and i'm thinking of course this in cultural terms you know the, the those foundational things have not been attended to and so all we're left is the sort of the at, at you know the sort of the base tracings of a thing you know uh, uh, that has been ignored. It, it reminds me of um, uh, the Canticle of Leibowitz. You know, it's like this: we, we've been we've been walking through the wasteland for so long that we don't even really know it. We haven't even mm -hmm. we've been un, sort of unconsciously uh, been been walking out on a limb, and and we've lost connection to the roots. Um, mm -hmm. And and again, this is not you know some sort of stupid blood and guts and right ground or whatever that whatever the stupid mantras are uh, for, for that sort of thing but but really we have lost um our connection to who we are um yeah yeah and that's um if you look at what's going on in the churches you know this is right. what i said in the benedict option that right. you know the people or young people are falling away because you know people of my generation and our parents generation haven't given them much of anything and now we're shocked shocked that they don't believe anymore um yeah i mean it's this is a an ongoing story i remember I, 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 I do have i do have a quick story on this one i remember so i was in in graduate school in the in the mid 90s um in english and um that was sort of the that was right at the tail end of the sort of the dominance of the postmodernist in academy so derrida and 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 all of you know all Foucault especially and Baudrillard and all of all of the postmodernists were sort of right at their apex and there were a couple of of aging you know first first you know slice of baby boomers who were heading toward retirement and these were the architects for the destruction of the canon wars back in the day when they were saying oh you mm -hmm. don't need to read Shakespeare you don't need to read Moby Dick like these are just sort of tools of power oppression etc and I remember you were starting to find at the end of these guys careers I was remember this 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 uh this famous academic at the time Franklin Trickia and he himself bemoaned there was a there was a a, a magazine called Lingua Franca, which was, uh, I don't even know if it still exists, but it was sort of the uh, kind of the variety magazine of academia. Uh, variety is the the, the, the trade the, journal. Yeah, the, the trade, right. It's a trade journal. Thank you. Um, and he was sort of bemoaning the fact like, yeah, you know, I, I have all of these students and they come to me, they, these graduate students, and they they haven't even read Moby Dick. Like they haven't even read, you know, uh, Shakespeare. And of course, I'm sitting there thinking like, yeah, because all of the idiots listened to you. You destroyed the canon and now you're shocked, shocked that nobody knows anything. Well, guess what? You built this world. You built this world. Yeah. And so I hear, and I mean, you're Catholic, you knew this, and I was Catholic for, for a long time, yeah. that it's so common to meet people of our generation who know nothing about what the Catholic Church teaches because they were not catechized. Yeah. You know, I remember when I first moved to New York uh, back in the late 90s, it, it became common for me to meet people who had left the Catholic faith and they would say, you know, beat, beat, 
Thank God for my Jesuit but, education. Yeah, right. Which is like, which is what been an education in in destruction and, and deconstruction. Right. You right. know, there, there was a fascinating uh, a conversation between Bishop Barron and Jordan B. Peterson that came out a few days ago, and uh, Peterson really, uh, in his very you know gentlemanly way, kind of goes after the good bishop um, and says, "Look, you know, what what are you guys doing wrong? You guys are bleeding people left and right." And it was very fun for me to sort of watch Peterson, who's not a Catholic, who's not a Christian, um, uh, you know, bring Baron, take, try to take Baron to task. And Baron sort of, you know, he's so slick. Uh, you know, he's good. I'm, he's, I'm good. He, he's good at what he does. All right? I don't yeah, want to yeah, be yeah. a jerk about this, but he's slick and he sort of kind of deflects the question is sort of like, well, yeah, sure. You know, we were, we weren't given much. And it's like, yeah, like, how about we start doing that? You know, Peterson, of course, is the outsider who gets parachuted in and he looks at the situation like a good scientist, like a good, you know, mm -hmm. anthropologist, like you guys are doing something wrong, yeah. like really wrong. Like, how about you wake up to this? How about you not, you know, uh, continue down this stupid path of, 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 of what you've set up? But yeah, no, but but to, to know is to be responsible. responsible. Uh, just reading last night uh, uh, on something on Steve Skojic's blog, uh, Pope John Paul II was asked early in his reign about the third secret of Fatima, right? Ah, yes. Oh, Why yes. hasn't the Vatican released this? And John Paul said, well, you know, a lot of people want to know this just out of morbid curiosity, but people should realize that to know something is to be responsible yeah. for that knowledge. And a lot of people just aren't willing to do what is necessary in light of that knowledge. Now, I don't want to go down the third secret of Fatima. No, 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 we're not but, doing But, but it's, it's, a, it's a principle that yeah. is uh, we can really see playing out right now with so many middle-class people who have become decadent you know, even conservatives, even Christians uh, become decadent and do not want to wake up and see what's happening in their own country, in their own society, in their own churches, because they're not prepared to act in the face of this information. Yeah. And uh, with that grim uh, conclusion, I, I'm going to need to wrap this up because I've got an appointment uh, across where, town. Where, where, where are you headed, Rod? Uh, I've got to go meet with the deputy prime minister. Um, and oh. uh, I've yet yeah, got <laughs> Oh yes, yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, right after this. Actually, no, I'm not. I'm going to go grade a couple of quizzes. That, that's yeah, yeah. Doing. Well, well, normally I would have gone to like a bathe Roscoe or something back home, but, but this is a, it, it's a really great opportunity and um, just to learn and uh, and you know, learn about a new, a different society. I'm interested also in politics here. The Fidesz party that has been a ruling party for a while. It's pretty far down in the polls going up to the 2022 election. So. Uh, I'm going, to, I'm going to want to find out what that's about and uh, what the criticisms are and what their responses are. So anyway, this is going to be a great learning experience. And you and I will be doing this weekly from Budapest. Hopefully we next will. time I'll have a better uh, background. Yeah, and we'll, we'll, we'll figure this out. We won't, we'll get to do it in the proper um, uh, venue. But uh, I, I was struck by something you wrote. I want to talk about this next time. But I was shocked, shocked to find uh, that when you were a child and saw Star Wars for the first time, that you immediately were attracted to Darth Vader. And I was shocked by that because when I saw um, Star Wars for the first time, and I must have been, what, uh, six six years old, seven years old, something like that. I was terrified of Darth Vader and I was a big Luke Skywalker fan, but I was a little bit younger than you. So maybe there's an interesting question to be had about that. I I can't believe you were a Darth Vader guy. I, I can't believe I was either, but he was so much cooler and he had the best TIE fighter, but all right, next true, time. True, next time. All right. Uh, okay, don't, don't get nothing on you. I got to figure out how to say that in Magyar. Oh, good luck. All right. Cheers, everybody. <laughs> Take care. Bye.